sexual and reproductive health forms the basis of our conversation in keeping with a review of the SDG report for 2024. And joining us in the studios this morning is Asifa Agede, who is uh, the Program Coordinator, Center for Health System Support and Initiatives for Development. Nice to have you join us on the show this morning. Nice to be here as well. Thank you. Nice to have you on the show. Um, getting straight into the conversation, we would like to start with, um, we know that before the SDG goals, we had the MDG goals, that's the uh, Millennium. Uh, Millennium Development Goals, which unfortunately Nigeria wasn't able to meet up with before we now have the SDG goals that is really running to an end. Uh, for you with this report, what will be your take on Nigeria's performance so far? And what could have been done to have made it better? Okay, with um, only 17% of the goals being on track, um, progress has been made, including in countries like Nigeria, especially with the reduction in um, female rates of female genital mutilation, reduction in rates of um, unintended pregnancies um, amongst um, um, adolescents and young people, reduction in maternal mortality and all. Even in, because Nigeria makes up um, a huge you know, contribution to the world population of 8 billion. Progress has been made. However, that progress does not spread across all the classes, all the locations, all the young people across, um, across Nigeria. You know, while progress has been made in certain areas or certain locations, there are some people, there are some women, some girls that um, we'll say have been left behind due to some factors, maybe due to socioeconomic status, due to access to information, due to access to education, you know, due to access to health facilities and um, some other practices like child marriage and all. Um, while um, we also made progress in, in terms of girl-child education, we are also grappling with security challenges in, in several parts of Nigeria and that has also um, somewhat um, helped cost us to regress in the progress that we have made. Um, so the, the progress is not even, even within Nigeria. That is one of the key challenges um, as to why, while progress has been made, we cannot say that that's the same for every young woman, every young person in Nigeria. Now looking at um, policies that has been made so far, how has this policy, have these policies um, helped in reducing the disparity in the social class, in acceptability of um, these uh, um, um, goals in the country? Well, yes, Nigeria has, has um, in terms of policy, we have some good policies. We have the, you know, the VAP Act, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act of 2015. Several states in the country have also um, enacted at the state levels and all. But there are also issues with implementation. We have other um, policies and um, frameworks that speak to rights, speak to reproductive health and all. Uh, but there are issues with regards to implementation. Because some of these factors that drive um, limited access to sexual reproductive health and rights and services are deep rooted in culture, are deep rooted in traditional and religious norms. And so um, sometimes for some of these laws, they are not even tested because people don't want to be the ones to, you know, I don't want to be the odd one out. Especially, and case in point is um, around female genital mutilation. I personally have not heard of you know anyone testing that law in court, uh, the prohibition against female genital mutilation because it's a cultural practice. It's embedded in culture, and people um, people own or carry along their cultures, hold cultural practices very dear. In terms of especially around um, um, sexual and gender, sorry, gender-based violence, physical violence, and all um, sexual violence. Um, you know, the, the conditions, you know, you need some of the evidence you need to take to court and all that. I feel they are very stringent and there's the, their status of limitation and all that. So some of those things I feel st um, stand as limitations to the successful implementation of um, some of the policies that we have. We also have um, the, um, the, the, um, the updated, the, the National Health Insurance Act. Age Act, yeah, Act. NHIA. NHIA. It's improved. It also um, covers for vulnerable groups, which would include young people and all. But 
um, we are still to see how far that this has been implemented or how this, how this is going to practically look like. How are we going to include vulnerable people? How, especially young people, some of them are, um, we call them, well, the time we call them emancipated because some of them are young, but they don't, they are not living with caregivers. They live on their own. They are not in the formal sectors. So how, how do we include them? How do we, they access health services through some of these um, frameworks that the government has? Now, let's also pick up some uh, of the tweets with infographics greeting it as published by the Nigerian Health Watch on its verified X handle. Now, the look at that tweet talks about the unequal access to sexual and reproductive health services, which remains a major barrier, especially in countries like Nigeria, where maternal mortality rates are high. Now, the UNFPA also has a new hashtag swap2024 report which offers strategies to tackle these inequalities. Now, a, a closer look at this in terms of the infographics, you'd find that in Nigeria's population demographics, at least 70% of the population is under 30 years old. Mm. Now, that infographics highlights the key markers for those in black, which highlights the population of under 30, while those in red are those over 30. Now, interestingly, in terms of this demographics, what it means is that uh, the survival factors for women expecting uh, children, especially those who are under 30, has recorded over 290,000 maternal deaths, with 1.9 million stillbirths at week 28 of pregnancy. And newborns also pass on within the first months of having been birthed, accounting for 2.3 million since the year 2015. Now, key facts in this statistics are one, progress in improving survival has stagnated since 2015. Approximately the 290,000 maternal deaths each year is even more worrying. Well, this continues to be one of the key issues when we talk about improving access to sexual reproductive health. Yes, families conceive it's a beautiful news carrying the baby through the trimester of pregnancy and owing to this report at week 28 where we're approaching beyond the halfway line towards birthing a child at probably week 39 or 40 still have issues of stillbirths 290,000 deaths quite worrying and Nigeria falls in the rank of countries with this sad report how do we go about concerted efforts to reduce these numbers in terms of what it means for maternal and child health okay um, interestingly, interestingly, just um, yesterday, I lost a relative um, due to complications from, um, from um, childbirth. Okay. Uh, our, our condolences. Yeah, thank you. And um, this is this is someone who who could afford, you know, healthcare. Um, but then again, sometimes it's it's beyond it's beyond the resources that you have. You look at the healthcare infrastructure as well. You look at the system in itself. You look at the quality of care that women and girls have um, access to in Nigeria. If you live, if you live um, within the urban centers, it makes a whole difference, um, you know, uh, between um, life and death when it comes to um, your matern a woman's maternal health survival. It makes a difference whether you, you know, whether you survive or whether you don't survive. And then there are women who live in rural areas, there are girls who live in rural areas where um, there is no access, especially with regards to roads. There are no health facilities within reach, especially for ob emergency obstetric, obstetric care. Um, not all of them are able to even meet up the, the minimum requirement for antenatal care visits, which is supposed to be four for each woman. And um, then there's also, there's also um, access to resources because like I mentioned earlier, I talked about um, access to sexual and reproductive um, health care or universal access to access to health care or health insurance. Um, not everybody has that. So it, we basically do out of pocket expenditures. That is also a limiting factor. And then especially when it comes to girls, when it comes to women, you know, as a young girl, decision making is in the hands of your caregivers or your parents. Now, some of these girls are married off early before they turn 18. Yeah, especially that demographics yeah. of under 30. Most yes. of them don't even get to 18. They don't get to 18. They marry early and then the, the power to make decision is also transferred to the husband or to mm -hmm. whoever that partner is. 
so she does not have power at any point to make decisions about their, her health so whether she accesses antenatal care is in the hands of somebody else somebody has to make is going to make that decision for her and whatever they choose she's going to deal with the outcome she does not have access to resources because again if she's married before 18 and it means that she probably has not completed school and then her um, economic you know outcome economic um resources access to economic resources is also affected um and then most times these girls are let me use the term immature especially with regards to their reproductive you know system in regards to decision making they are unable to make sound decisions because again you need to have information you need to have the right information to be able to make a, a, um, a sound decision when the time comes so it affects decision making and also some of these things limit access to to care and then this this is what translates to the uh, mortality rates that we see the numbers that we see these are women these are girls that ordinarily have the right to leave because giving birth giving life should not be a threat to anybody's life is a joyful thing it's 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 such a beautiful thing and um it shouldn't be that women girls are dying in nigeria just because they are you know giving but it shouldn't be that children are dying because maybe there is lack of access maybe the, the, when they then they, they needed maybe emergency care maybe there was no light there was no light it also falls yeah, down on the facilities, the facilities. And yes, centers as yes. Well. and then the the, the 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 um the health workers overstretched overstretched you look at you go to the hospital one doctor is seen how many people is mm -hmm. that you go to some facilities there is no doctor because at the community level sometimes there is no doctor at the fact there are no doctors and then you look at you see women also make up over 70 percent of the health workforce and most of this they are underpaid under motivated under trained most of them are working at that level as volunteers especially the community health extension workers so the compensation is poor, the capacity is limited. Sometimes they want to do their best, but you can only do your best within, you know, the available, the available, um, the available resources. So we need to begin to look at, we need to look, begin to look at some of this, the different classes, the different locations, the different, because you see women, the challenges that women face are different from the challenges that girls face. Mm. An adolescent pregnant girl is going to have a unique set of, you know, challenges from a woman that is married and is pregnant mm. she's dealing with stigma she's dealing with stigma she's dealing with isolation she's dealing with you know uh, maybe her education is cut off especially at the secondary school level because we also don't have a system i know that some states may have a system where girls can come back to school but we also don't have widely in nigeria we do also don't have a system where girls can come back to school or choose to stay in school in spite of teenage you know pregnancy mm. um, back then in secondary school I had a number of classmates that dropped off just because they got pregnant and for most of them they never had the opportunity to go back to school because the family's like okay like it's a waste meanwhile the boy goes on to complete school but her education is is disrupted and then for this person who does not have all the information that they need they're also going to bring up other children and how can they provide guidance how can they provide guidance to the children that are bringing, you know, um, into the into the world. So it's important to look at the statistics. These are not just numbers. These are human beings, and we need to begin to go to those places that ordinarily, you know, we work in such a way that we go to places as um, development workers as well. We go to locations that are convenient. You go to a school mm -hmm. and you are providing maybe menstrual health, maybe menstrual hygiene information, and the girls already know. Mm -hmm. But there are girls somewhere who are probably not in school are probably not on the streets who do not have access to radio or television or social media we do social media campaigns we do we go to streets we go to some of some of these there are some girls that are not there we need to be able to find where they are and then it also calls for the need for data where are they so that we are programming we have our programs we are not just programming off the top of our heads data is informing what we are doing where we are doing it and for whom we are doing it. If we have data, up-to-date data, we, we, we will know what the needs are. You know, needs change over time. What an adolescent girl needed 10 years ago, five years ago, maybe slightly different from what an adolescent needs today, or what the, what the one in, um, in Abuja, in Geriki needs, maybe different from the one, what the one in my village 
or in another remote village. And then there are also girls with insecurity, you know, they rise in insecurity. There are also girls in, um, in displaced um, persons camps and all that. They also have needs. Some camps, people that but some camps are by the roadside so you know people there's heavy traffic there's heavy traffic there are camps that are in hard to reach locations and it's as if those ones are left behind so we need to find the girls we need to find the boys we need to find the women and then we need to involve everyone it's not just about government or development partners or the girls or the women or health sector it's about everyone the men the boys the community leaders working together to you know, joining hands together to see that these numbers drop. Now, talking numbers, Dr. Senan Hutton of uh, the UNFPA, who is the director of West Africa and Central Africa, has some interesting stats, which he talked about, talking about the population of adolescent young girls who need improvement in access to certain health reproductive care. And a piece will take us through his comments as captured on the infographics. Yes, and uh, that says that every month around 118 million people across West and Central Africa menstruate, but with millions of people lacking access to secure, clean facilities and supplies for managing menstruation, exacerbating school dropouts for girls and heliating their full potential and increasing poverty. Let's all ensure the rights of women and girls remain fulfilled. And that's coming from Dr. Senen Houghton, uh, the UNFPA Regional Director for West Africa and um, Central Africa. Um, taking into cognizance this um, from uh, Dr. Senen, uh, we look at Nigeria. There, there was a time there was a call that at least in every... Um, public facility in the toilets there should be at least a pad to help but the question is we have schools we have communities even to this point that do not have a working water system some do not even have good pit toilets to even start with so how do we begin this campaign okay um, interestingly, the other month we it was the uh, was the, we commemorated the 2024 World Menstrual Day. Yeah, yeah, Hygiene Day, and these are some of the things that we were talking about. Because you see, interestingly, today as we are, over 300 million, you know, women and girls are menstruating. Mm. So menstruation is a good thing. It's a, in, an important feature of the reproductive health of a woman and a girl, but it is then associated with stigma women are shamed basically because of um, maybe lack of information lack of understanding of the, in, the the vital role that menstruation um plays in the life of a woman and a girl and because um it's like a tab it, it, it was like a taboo um, subject and then like again i'm like i'm saying again in some settings it is something that people discuss freely mm -hmm. but in some settings it is still a taboo you know subject um, that is why sometimes it, it, now this leads to um, limited access to resources, information, or to um, materials, menstrual um, hygiene management materials like the sanitary pads that are used to collect, you know, or to trap the blood during menstruation and all that. And then with um, inflation rates, let's not go there the because cost of the sanitary <laughs> pads it's something that we will not talk about let's today let's not go there um so how do we ensure that women go through and girls go through dignity uh, their periods with dignity mm. with um with access to these materials with access to some of other supplies like water like you are saying water soap and all that we need to begin to look at um maybe options um, when I talk to people, I also talk about alternatives like um, reusable sanitary pads. But even with reusable pan sanitary pads, you need to have water mm. to you maintain need proper hygiene. To maintain hygiene, proper yes. hygiene because there's there's um, and it, they're not cheap either. They are not cheap either, and they need to be washed properly and s dried in the sun. I remember I was talking to a number of people th that month, and someone said that um, someone was concerned about drying those under the sun. Mm. You know outside because someone will use them for f come and use for fetish yeah. reasons so we are dealing with some of those 
myths as well. We're dealing with some of those beliefs as well. But if you want to use, um, maybe go, go the way of, if you need to go the way of a reusable sanitary pad, then you need to also prioritize hygiene. If not, you are setting yourself up for some other reproductive health um, challenges. challenges or health issues down the line. There are also tampons, there are also menstrual cups. There are options that people can use. Some people use rags, rags in the sense that just clothes, use clothing. But again, mm -hmm. maintaining good hygiene, having access to water is, some, is, um, is another thing. And some of these um, are things that are beyond the way people at the community levels. Mm -hmm. Are, are things that government has to so again there has to be a multi-sectoral approach different partners working prioritizing the health of women and girls because if it affects menstrual health then it affects the entire reproductive health mm. of that um of that woman of 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 that girl mm. <laughs> now let's let's look at um, the place of adolescent um girls you know one thing that comes with um, menstruation especially at the beginning is that it naturally has this way of um, setting on your mental health, especially when you do not have prior information as to the fact that oh, at a certain age this would come and all that. And now we now see uh, the place of um, the environment. How do we begin to curb stigma that comes with the environment? I, I could recall while I was in the secondary school, we had people that came to t teach yeah. us. I know the boys were looking at it like, eh, you know? And for some ladies, they stay in that and they don't, they can't even talk when they are facing some challenges. By the time you notice, it has become some other reproductive health challenges. Mm -hmm. So how do we begin to cut that stigma and begin to give a welcoming environment for the adolescent girl, the teen girl that is just about to begin this journey? Okay, um, that's interesting. It's comprehensive sexuality education. That's basically giving young people information that is age appropriate that relates to their sexual and reproductive their sexual and reproductive health um there's information that is appropriate for the child that is from nine years to 12 years and you know like that information that is appropriate to them so that they are prepared like you're saying um we were in secondary school some of us it just came we didn't have anybody tell us anything mm. um with some for some for some young girls okay again there are several factors for some young girls it, maybe they, they, they lost their parents or parents also did not know uh, it's not something we talk about it's something that just happens and all that so comprehensive sexuality education is key and um having people you can talk to you know that for the, the, the young people should have people they can talk to, people they trust. Sometimes young people feel that no one understands, no one will know. It's important to have that one person that you can talk to and get seek guidance from. If it's in the school setting, maybe someone, member of the staff, if it's in the community, there's usually there's always the one person that is receptive towards, you know, people. And then another key thing is, another key strategy that we always adopt is male engagement involving men, involving boys. When we talk to girls, we talk to boys as well. Sometimes we talk to them together, then we separate them, and then we begin to deal with the issues with the girls, and then begin to talk with the boys as well, because boys also need to understand. Mm. Especially in, in school settings, sometimes there is no toilet, sometimes the toilet is far. Boys, and sometimes there are security issues. The girl is too far, the girl is afraid of, of going to the, to the restroom and all that. The boys can, be, can protect her if they understand what it is. Especially because at that level, sometimes um, there's something that period poverty, they don't have access to some of these materials. And so sometimes the girl is stained. If the boys understand what the issues are, they may not laugh yeah. so much, you know. And, and then, you know, because of sometimes there's a lack of facilities or inadequate facilities, water and all for their, you know, for their, for them to maintain proper hygiene, sometimes they miss out on school. Mm. Sometimes they miss out on school. Um, men, men, and then menstruation is an experience that is different for everyone. Some people have excruciating cramps. Some people have different experiences. And it's interesting that sometimes girls uh, believe that you should just bear the pain. <laughs> you should just bear the pain. It, because maybe if I take it, my body will get used to taking painkiller and then it will not stop. Uh, but this is about dilation. This is about. Um, you should seek help when you need to seek help. Because sometimes there may be underlying issues. 
it's not just that okay menstruation is painful and so menstruation is it you should seek help but it is when we open uh, platforms for safe safe platforms for conversations again i'm talking we're talking about um, having these conversations education in schools how about those girls that are not in school how about those girls that have been married off you know because she's married we assume that or the world assumes that she her can responsibility take care of, is that yes, of her husband yes and then that, that she should know but this girl also has gaps in knowledge and information mm. how does she manage she's dealing with adult things she's dealing with the responsibility of the home how does she also manage how does she even understand her own body mm. and how to manage you know what is going on within her so we need to think around reaching these girls mm. wherever they are beyond you know the tra the, the normal just, just to add to that, you know, it feels surprising to know that some ladies don't even know how to calculate these things. They don't even know how to track this, their periods. They don't know how to track it, yes. even till the age of, some of them have even given birth. Yes. As older women, they still do not understand how to track. So the place of education, I think, like you rightly said, is very, very important. Well, just in case you're just joining us, it's our broad topic of discussion this morning informed by the SDG report of 2024. And we've chosen to single out one of the issues as it affects adolescents owing to the report and the population of Nigerians who are under 30 who have reproductive health age but have some challenges in accessing sexual and reproductive health care services. Now, now, some issues have been highlighted in terms of poor menstrual uh, sanitation. sanitation, unwanted pregnancies as well. Uh, let's pick up that report as published by the verified handle of the united nations nigeria on its x handle you'd find comments uh, coming in as of when it was published saying today un secretary general at antonio guterres launched the hashtag sdg report 2024 the report revealed that only 17 percent of the sdg targets are on track with half showing limited progress and over one third stalling or regressing let us affirm our commitment to hashtag SDGs. Now the infographic also gives us uh, more on the charting on the SDGs that are on track. With less than one fifth of the target on track, the world is failing to deliver on the SDG promise. Mm -hmm. And then you see the key in terms of the color bar, 17, 18%, 30, 18%, and then 17, regressing as well, 17%. Now this assessment with the trend of the data has also looked at some of the initiatives as on ground. Many would refer to the UNFPA's reproductive health for all. You talked about some of the advantages that male uh, students or young boys have above female, which is the fact that they can carry on with education in the event of unwanted pregnancies. This is one very touchy conversation. Many have talked about giving access to these young adolescent girls of reproductive age to have access to preventive measures more in terms of family planning this debate has elicited a lot of different reactions some caregivers are saying in the event that they go into the future it might Affects have, have issues with them mm. when they want to take in some myths that need to be dispelled how do we begin to create a safe platform for conversations to be had that these girls should be at least given some access to preventive measures to forestall unwanted pregnancies okay um i, I think there's an interesting disconnect between the reality of the young people and some of the caregivers you know th th there's, th th there's, there's a disconnect because uh, sometimes the caregivers or the parents are not in touch with the realities the, the recommendation is for young people to abstain from sexual intercourse but then um, sometimes there are circumstances that prevent that um, usually especially with regards to sexual debut you will find that girls have their first sexual contact earlier than an average boy. Why? Most of the time, someone is taking advantage of her in terms of exploitation, mm -hmm. in terms of sexual abuse, in terms of um, unequal power play. She's not, she's not, so she did not, most of the time the girl does not choose sometimes is a teacher sometimes it's a caregiver sometimes it's somebody respected in the community sometimes it's a total stranger raping them so she did not choose that so it's not about uh, your, the girl is promiscuous no is that she's a victim of circumstance 
And so if we say, if we do not look into the deep issues, the smaller issues, and we say that young people or adolescents should not have access to reproductive, um, you know, to um, reproductive health services or products, then um, we are doing these girls a disservice. We need to look at the issues. We need to look at the different, you know, the, dif the different girls, the, the different circumstances of their lives. And then um, when, when, and then um, because we also have, we also have, um, it's a global village, you have access to the internet, you have access to information, so much information, sometimes it's even difficult to control. <laughs> sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to control the information that young people have access to. Young people, adolescence is an age where young people want to experiment. They take risks. And if you are standoffish and talking at them, they will not come to you when there is a need to seek guidance. The, and then young people go to themselves, they ask themselves questions, and imagine that um, is it sometimes it's the case of the blind leading the blind. You know, if, if, they, if they seek this information, if they do not have access to, to um, informed or to professionals or to adults who have the right information, and they seek information from their, their peers, peers yeah. who may or may not have um, the accurate information, then sometimes that information is harmful. It also brings us to the, the challenges with um, accessing care, you know, the issues around stigma issues around um, youth-friendly health services where they can just come and seek help and seek guidance and ask, you know, and ask, um, and ask questions. So I think that for me and for young people having access to information, young people having access to um, services, to products, where there is need. If it is when they have the right information that they can make informed decisions. Um, years ago, I, we, <coughs> we had um, a peer education program, you know, for young people, where young people were identified and trained as peer educators to provide information to their peers. And it recorded huge successes, young people, because they, they, they were able to confide in themselves. Some, some um, um, a particular lady who had, been, who had been raped, but had kept quiet, you know, because there was no one she could talk to. Because she, a, another young person approached her, she, she, she spoke to the person and was able to get guidance. You know, she was linked to who will help her, who would provide, listen to her and provide the services that, um, that she needed. So young people should have access to sexual reproductive health services, especially around family, around conception, uh, contraception. But then young people should also take the lead, you know, in providing information, at least in terms of um, peer education. Because where they talk, the things they talk about on the WhatsApp group they belong to, so they will not give us access. You will be shocked. <laughs> they, will not, they don't <laughs> give us access to those platforms. So when they have their peers they can talk to, they can relate to, mm. um, it will help increase access and then bring down rates of um, unintended pregnancies. It's not just unintended pregnancies, sexual transmitted infections, including HIV, including the... Uh, um, STIs. Yeah, STIs, and then the... Um, It's, it's quite a lot. It's yes. very encompassing. Yes. <laughs> and the month of July is quite significant between, because between the 8th of July to the 18th, there is a high-level political forum to hold in New York. And this has been informed by the data that shows that the world is fast falling behind its 2030 target in terms of sustainable development, particularly amongst the 17 SDGs, SDG number three, which pertains to good health and well-being. Uh, as we look to wrap up this conversation, it, it's in a bid to also provide that safe space for young persons. Uh, many have had the conversations on if we can have more youth-friendly health centers. Because most young persons, like you said, who entertain some phobia and opening up about their peculiar sex, sexual and reproductive health challenges, complain that caregivers in some facilities are not youth-friendly at all. <laughs> yes, um, again, um, that is very true. And I know that I'm not even sure about the functionality of some of these youth, youth um, friendly centers. I know they were, they were quite functional some years ago. I don't know about now. I know that I know in Nasara State there was one. Um, at the point I was there, it was just there. It was no longer in use, you know. And ordinarily that would have been, that was a good opportunity or a good platform for young people to access safe um, um, services. So we need to go, we need to invest more in um, setting up or managing or revamping the youth friendly centers, and then invest in 
the healthcare workforce as well, the capacity. Um, sometimes it is because people also have their biases, their cultural, their religious, their, their, their biases that they grew up with, and they, they bring these biases into the place of work, and it affects the way they provide services to the clients in the, in the, in the, in the health facilities. So we need to invest more in the um, in the um, capacity, yeah, yeah. In the capacity mm. of the health or the service providers, in the service providers, and then of course the commodities, access to the commodities, and again, um, um, we're also talking about um, universal health coverage access, especially in terms of cost, um, because these services come at also as at a cost as well. How do they afford? It may be what is hundred naira may seem like is nothing to someone. But that hundred naira is going to be the difference between whether someone gets access to treatment or to services or not. Mm -hmm. So how do we level some of those gaps, those um, dis dis um, disparities? We must thank you for your time on the program this morning. We also extend our very heartfelt condolences to your family okay. uh, yeah. on the demise of your relative owing to complications from childbirth.